This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. For over 100 years, the residents of a tiny Texas town have witnessed mysterious lights hovering in the distance. They call them ghost lights. And tonight, for the first time, we present evidence that these ghost lights are real. A quarter of a million dollars of platinum vanished from a Pennsylvania factory, and so did security guard Dale Kerstetter. Video cameras recorded the robbery. Was Kerstetter abducted, or was he an accomplice? We'll ask you to join the war on drugs with a profile of Salvatore Caruana, the head of a drug smuggling thing, who allegedly possesses information that could put major organized crime figures behind bars. On a previous broadcast, we told how during the 1920s, hundreds of orphans from the streets of New York were put on trains and taken to the Midwest to begin new lives with new families. In many cases, brothers and sisters were separated. Tonight, thanks to our viewers, the heartwarming reunion of two orphan train children who haven't seen each other for 60 years. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. Saturday, September 12, 1987, began as a typical workday for Dale Kirsten. The 50-year-old security guard and maintenance man had worked for 27 years at the Corning Glassworks plant in Bradford, Pennsylvania. At 11 p.m., Kirstetter began his shift as a weekend security guard. That night, a quarter of a million dollars worth of platinum pipe vanished from the plant. Dale Kerstetter was never seen again. Pound for pound, platinum is one of the most precious commodities in the world. It is even more expensive than gold. In addition to its beauty as jewelry, platinum was widely used in manufacturing. After Dale Kerstetter and a fortune in platinum pipe disappeared from the Corning factory, authorities were mystified. Was Kerstetter the unwitting victim of a robbery, or had he engineered the heist himself? Dale Kerstetter grew up in Bradford, and except for his years in the Air Force, lived there all his life. Kerstetter had been divorced for 10 years, and his teenage son still lived with him. Four of his five daughters also lived in Pennsylvania. He was uh, very compassionate, honest, um, liked to have fun, loved the outdoors. He was very faithful to everybody, and he hated a lie. He never believed in lying. He's just a great father. I mean, there wasn't a kid in the world that wouldn't want to have him as her dad. Dale was a uh, uh, marginal employee. Yeah, he was a slow worker, and yeah, we had some problems with it occasionally. But at the same time, we're looking at an employee who, uh, at the risk of his own life, probably saved half a dozen lives and hundreds of thousands of dollars of property value. We had an incident uh, several years ago where a, a forklift that accidentally rolled underneath a uh, stream of hot molten glass, and the glass was actually pouring down onto the propane tank in the back of the uh, forklift. Dale immediately jumped onto the forklift and drove it out from underneath the hot stream of glass. So uh, you can look at him one side and see where you might get involved in something like this. At the same time, maybe you wouldn't. Sunday morning, September 13th. When security guard John Lindquist arrived at 7 a.m., he expected to find Dale Kerstetter waiting to be relieved. He is usually sitting right inside the door, and he wasn't there. 
So I walk to the cafeteria, and I see his lunch pail sitting on the table. I happened to pick up the newspaper, and there the keys was. So then I looked in his lunch pail, and I see it was all, everything was there. He hadn't ate. Later Sunday morning, Kerstetter's new pickup truck was discovered in the parking lot, and the police were called to investigate. The truck yielded a number of clues that suggested Kerstetter had not disappeared voluntarily. His keys were in the ignition. He had left behind a full carton of cigarettes, an empty holster from his 22 caliber pistol, and his day pack. On Sunday afternoon, the sheriff's canine unit was brought in to track Kerstetter in the 112,000 square foot factory. Police were concerned that Kerstetter might have suffered a heart attack or fallen and injured himself somewhere in the vast building. The dog led police to the second floor. This was a site of the plant's glass kiln, also known as the tank. Although the tank contained valuable platinum pipe, it was not normally on Kerstetter's security rounds. Kerstetter's scent was found at the tank, but he was nowhere in the building. The investigation next focused on the three security cameras that monitored the factory around the clock. Personnel manager Patrick Foley was surprised and disturbed by what the cameras had recorded we have recreated the key sequences found on the tapes. The first thing I saw was a masked man in the back of the plant in the one area. When I saw the masked man on a tape, I was very alarmed. At first I thought, well, obviously this person, there's been some, some foul play, Dale's involved in foul play, and he, and he probably is missing. And then uh, Dale Kerstetter came back and met this masked person in the back of the plant. I, I guess I would say I had a very empty feeling in my stomach. I said, what on earth? And then as I continued to review the tapes and I saw the masked person come back out and go up to the tank area, then I was extremely anxious because at that time I realized that not only did we have a missing employee, we also, there was a good possibility that we had missing platinum in the, in the plant. Whoever removed the platinum from the tank was extremely familiar with the plant, everything in the plant, they knew exactly where to go. You have to remember that this transpired late at night. There were very few lights on in the plant, but yet this person knew exactly where to go, where to find bags that they needed, tools that they needed, how to go up to the tank and move back out of the tank area. The most perplexing moment in the tapes is this interaction between the guard and the intruder. Is Kerstetter being coerced, or simply pretending to be coerced? At one point, he looks directly into the camera. Was Kerstetter secretly signaling for help, or was he coolly flaunting his crime? If he was involved, why would he willingly walk in front of a camera? Knowing that it was there, he knew the camera was there. Why wouldn't an attempt have been made to cover the camera? It just doesn't make sense. I think the, the fact that he did everything in front of the cameras was once again just Dale Kerstetter to say to us, look, hey, here I am. I'm taking your platinum, and there isn't a thing you can do about it. If he had planned on taking off anywhere, why would he bother packing lunch? I mean, just little things like that, and a whole carton of cigarettes, and he smoked all the time. I mean, he would have taken his cigarettes. Kerstetter's daughters believe he was an innocent victim. According to their theory, Kerstetter heard or saw the masked intruder and went to investigate. The intruder, fearing discovery and intent on his robbery, may have murdered Dale Kerstetter. One camera showed the intruder wheeling out a heavy bag on a manual forklift. There's a very good possibility that bag could contain the platinum 
where there's a very good possibility that that bag could contain uh, the body of Dale Kerstetter. Everybody says, oh, keep up hope. But uh, if he was ever in on any of this, this thing that happened, he's out of his mind. A second theory places Kerstetter at the center of a bold and premeditated robbery. Dale was happy as a trades worker. Unfortunately, prior to this incident, he had just been cut out of the trade shop, uh, which entailed about a probably a five to seven thousand dollar cut for him. He was not a happy person at the time of this theft. Through our investigation, we determined that Dale Kerstetter was approximately thirty to forty thousand dollars in arrears on various payments, uh, trailer payments, uh, vehicle payments, and uh, different bills which he had owed throughout the area. He had children that could take care of him. I was in a financial position to take care of him. Uh, he had stock in Corning. He had money invested. If it got to the point where he really needed money, there was too many ways he could have obtained the money legally. I think that uh, Dale Kerstetter was a very intelligent man in a crafty sort of way. I think that uh, if he did not plan this thing by himself and do it with an accomplice, I think he was indirectly involved. Dale Kerstetter's family is anxious to know if he is alive. Whether he committed the crime or not, his family wants to know the truth. Hey, I don't care whether he was involved. That's not going to make me think any less of him or love him any less. What I want to know is what happened. Was he involved? Did he get away with it? Is he dead somewhere? Was he abducted? I don't think he'd do it unless he planned on coming back someday. He's, if he's alive, which I think he is, he's either in Canada or I'd say in Australia. And I figure in seven years when his statute of limitations up, he'll come back scot-free and he won't be able to touch him. I can't believe that. I can't believe he was in on that at all. No way. Shape or form. Mm. He had six kids, two grandkids. And to do something like that and take off and not call any of them, you know, just take off and never talk to your kids again, <laughs> I just. No, oh, I just can't believe it. <laughs> In the months that followed the theft, Corning sold his Bradford operation, and the new owners have informed us that platinum is no longer used at the facility. Dale Kerstetter's family continues to hope that he is safe. And if he is alive, Pennsylvania State Police want to question him about his involvement in the events of September 12th, 1987. Last August, we featured a story about New York City orphans who, between 1854 and 1929, were put on trains and taken to the South and Midwest in search of adoptive families. One of the orphan train riders profiled in our story was Sylvia Wemhoff. In 1921, at the age of three, Sylvia got off an orphan train in Columbus, Nebraska, where she was adopted by the John Mick family. When I was about 17, 18 years old, then I began to question my mother, Mick, whether I had any brothers or sisters. And if so, I wonder if we could ever get together. When Sylvia located her birth certificate, she learned that she was born Stephanie Volk and that she had an older sibling. For the next 52 years, she searched for the brother or sister she never knew. The day after our broadcast, Sylvia's search came to an end when she learned that her brother, 72-year-old Joseph Volk, was living in New York City. Volk's stepdaughter had seen our broadcast and recognized the names on Sylvia's birth certificate. On September 25th, Sylvia flew to New York and met her brother, Joseph, for the first time. Joseph, your sister Sylvia is here. <laughs> Are you... I'm Sylvia. Oh, Sylvia. Yeah. I'm so glad. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy, oh. too, to see him. Mm. Yeah. We hugged each other. 
and we were just really thrilled and happy that we finally, finally got together. I had heard I had a sister, and I was awfully pleased when I saw her and thankful, thankful to God. Yes, that's me on there. Most and brothers and sisters grow up sharing their lives together, but for Sylvia and Josie, the love and memories are just beginning. <laughs> the next man we will meet is Francis Murphy. In 1928, when he was 11, he too rode the orphan train. His baby sister, Margaret, and his mother, who was too poor to take care of him, were both left behind. When I got on the train, I didn't really feel that I was being wrenched away from somebody. I didn't know that much about my mother, so that it wasn't a matter of tearing me away from her, because I was away from her all the time anyway. It was a big adventure more than anything else. As a kid in New York, you have to remember that we didn't uh, know the West. And what we knew was from the picture shows we saw of cowboys and Indians and maybe engineers. And going that direction, well, that was the biggest thrill that a kid in my time could uh, really expect. <laughs> Francis's excitement soon turned to sadness. Hello, I'm Camille Mitchell at the Children's Aid Society. I brought your boys. At stop after stop, potential adoptive parents would be waiting to pick their child from the crowd. But not all the children found new parents. Francis, who had boarded the train in New York with such high hopes, began to realize that none of the families along the train's route wanted him. Hi, Lewis. Welcome to our family. 14 or 15 children that were leaving, and you got off the train with their belongings, and they told me, Francis, you should stay on the train. And he would see the crowd and get smaller and smaller until finally he was the only child left on the train. Bye-bye. All aboard! <laughs> Francis never was adopted. He went from family to family as a foster child. In spite of his early hardships, Francis's life turned out well. He became a high school teacher, married, and had five children and six grandchildren. Francis Murphy, who rode the orphan train 60 years ago, developed heart disease in 1987. And sadly, he died soon after we filmed his interview in November. Francis's wife and family have continued his search, and they ask that we present his story despite the fact that he is gone. They hope to unite the family who still loves Francis with a family he never knew and wanted so desperately to find. It was extremely important to Francis to go ahead with this interview. He'd been looking forward to it for literally months. And just the hope that he would find somebody, particularly his sister, was important. He didn't know much about love growing up. And he found out as he got older and had a family of his own. I think his finding Margaret would be an extension of that love. It's still very important to us that we finish what he tried to do. Eighteen eighty three, the plains of central Texas near the town of Marfa. A hundred years ago, cattle by the thousands were herded by cowboys across this arid country. One evening, during a roundup, a cowhand named Robert Ellis noticed a strange glow off in the distance. Could be Apaches. Yeah, it looks like Apache campfire. He saw a ghostly light shimmering in the darkness. 
It appeared to be a few miles away, and it hovered just a few feet above the ground. And they thought there were probably a campfire, Indians or other travelers, but they just kept seeing them. The next night they were there, and the next night, and the next week and year, and I'm sure they began to wonder what on earth were those lights. In 1916, Hallie Stilwell was 18 years old when she witnessed the same phenomenon. We had decided to come to Marfa to attend to a little business. We were just visiting and talking, and all of a sudden we saw lights over on the Shinati Mountains. Look, Hallie. It couldn't be any kind of car lights. And uh, we first thought probably it was a campfire of Indians or uh, Mexicans or ranchers but it didn't act like a campfire at all. Do you think they're campfires? It can't be a fire, it's moving. They were peculiar, and I'd never seen anything like them before. And of yeah. course, none of us uh, knew anything about it. We were not scientists or anything like that. So we said, well, it couldn't be anything but a ghost. It's just ghost lights. And uh, from then on, we mentioned them as ghost lights. In 1943, the mysterious lights were seen again near Marfa's yeah. Army Air Base. He won't be back for at least 30 minutes. When we Make saw the Marfa lights the first time, there was no vehicular traffic at night. Fuel was rationed. Lights were a phenomena in themselves in those days because there were no lights. Been a while. When the moon is out, it's beautiful. When the moon is not out, it's so dark, it's awesome. What's that? We saw something that was totally foreign to anything in and around the airbase. When we did see the lights, we were very curious, and we inquired in the village of Marfa about this, these strange things. And the, yeah, sure, we've got little lights. So what else? Over the years, explanations for these mysterious lights have ranged from ball lightning to St. Elmo's fire to jackrabbits with glowworms attached to their tails. Native superstition even has it that the lights are the ghost of an Apache chief who refuses to give up his desert home. The lights have been continually seen near the small town of Marfa, but surprisingly, the witnesses aren't frightened of these ghost lights. In fact, most seem to regard them with affection. I know they exist. I've seen them several times. Two of the four of us saw the lights. Two did not, and we were looking in exactly the same spot. Now, I can't explain that. I know they're there. There's no doubt about it. Some nights I see them better than other nights, though. When I was a child, of course, you have a lot of childlike curiosity, and my first thing was, I want to find out what those are. I mean, this is my Loch Ness monster. I'm going to catch it and find out what it is. And so I just, from that moment on, decided I was going to try to solve the mystery. Looks like we need to head southeast toward the Shinatis. A few years ago, my brother and I got the idea that the reason no one had ever gotten close to the lights was because they were using motor vehicles, like airplanes or jeeps or cars. So we thought if we took out on foot across the desert, we could sneak up on them. So we got our gear together in a camera and just took out walking across the desert and tried for about four hours to walk up close to them. And we never could get real close to them. It was almost like a mirage. It just kept moving a little further and further away from you. So it's almost like they knew what we were doing and were just going to tease us and stay a little bit ahead of us. But distance is so deceiving out here, we couldn't tell if we were looking at a light as big as a tire or if we were seeing a light as big as just a cantaloupe. And so we couldn't get close enough to really get a good idea of how big they were. The point is there's a, we have a force in the In July of 1989, we asked three scientists from the local observatory and university to conduct a formal investigation into the lights. One investigator was a professor of chemistry, another a geologist, and the third an astronomer. I, I wonder if we're, if we're not pushing just troughs of hot air up yes, on either exactly. side of Chinati yeah. down here. And there's With the them were 11 there. other technicians and observers. Almost Actually, you're calling it three, is that correct? The lights have been seen near the Chinati mountain range. A radio beacon is also visible in front of the peaks. A highway winds its way through these mountains, and in order to prevent the misidentification of headlights, 
two marker lights are placed at the borders of the road. If any lights are spotted outside these markers, and scientists cannot explain their source, then investigators can be certain that they are observing the ghostly phenomenon. Well, there was, a, there was a light right on the horizon. We have two cars leaving position one. The investigators are using special nighttime viewing equipment. I don't know whether that was. They are approaching the beacon now. In this instance, the camera films two headlights moving slowly from left to right past the radio beacon light. At 11.59 p.m., an unknown light appears. Doctor, look up there on the hill, uh, to the right of marker three. I see it. It's off to the right. It's about the same distance. The camera pans and past the, the radio beacon. The light is from three. Unit three, can you verify if you have any traffic lights off to the west or northwest? It continues past the right marker light. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the middle of an empty plane, a ghostly glow can be seen. A video camera also recorded the same light. This is going to verify the light we're seeing off to the west. Observers were certain that the light did not come from a man-made source. Beginning to fade, isn't it? It's gone way down. It's gone completely out now. It's almost like it imploded. Yeah. Negative, we do not have any light. Like a unit one, could you also verify that? Here it comes. It comes. Can you see it? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, it's coming back yeah. just as bright it? as it was before. Okay. Same place. It's beginning to fade out again. There it goes. It's extremely bright, though, when he was showing there. What was it that the cameras recorded? We know the lights are there. We know it is something of natural origin. It is not uh, man-made. Now, the next question is, uh, how do you explain them? There is something in addition to car lights. People are seeing real activity in the atmosphere. One scientist thought the lights might be refracted starlight, another luminous gases produced by small earthquakes. But they are not sure, and all they could say for certain is that it was a natural phenomenon as yet unexplained by science. Hey, what's that over there? I don't know. Could Most of the imagine? people in Marfa yeah, who've grown like up and lived with the lights don't really need any explanation as to what they are. The fact they exist at all, bringing a touch of magic into their day-to-day -day lives, is all they need to know. It's a phenomena that's not explained, and so uh, let's play that game. All I know is they're there. Let's don't find out what they are. Let's just leave them a mystery. I'm not going to try to solve it. I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to be content with ghosts and let the ghosts take care of them. <laughs> Next, the story of an innocent young couple whose romantic weekend was shattered by a sadistic and elusive killer. November 18, 1987, Jay Cook and his high school sweetheart, Tanya Van Kylenborg, took the ferry from Victoria, Canada to Washington State. Jay was 20 years old, Tanya was 17, and they were in love. This was to be their first trip together, and they had planned on a romantic weekend. Jay and Tanya had been going out together for about six months, I think. He was either there or she was here. Uh, I think she was quite special to him. They certainly seemed to be good for each other from everything that I could gather. Uh, I certainly had no apprehension about Tanya being with Jay. I, I felt very comfortable with that. But sometime during their journey, Jay and Tanya's peaceful vacation turned into a violent nightmare. The couple's trip began in Victoria, Canada, where they took the 4 p.m. car ferry to Port Angeles, Washington. Jay had borrowed his father's van, and after they disembarked from the ferry, they were seen twice heading south on Highway 101. 
once in the Washington town of Hood's Port at approximately 8 p.m., and an hour later at Allen, it is believed they were headed towards a second car ferry from Bremerton to Seattle. Jay and Tanya were expected home the following day, but when they hadn't returned or called by the next evening, their families began to worry. If Tanya was late for anything, uh, which was not unusual, but she would phone, she would always phone. So when Tanya did not phone the next evening when they were supposed to be returning, my wife became apprehensive. So I tried to downplay it for my wife's sake and probably to reassure myself that everything would be okay. Uh, however, on the following day when she didn't call, we knew there was something wrong. Tanya's body was found um, partially clothed. She had been uh, raped and murdered. We found some wire ties that you would bundle wires together with laying alongside the road. We assumed that they were used to secure Tanya in the van. Well, we didn't know what to think then because they hadn't found Jay. And uh, for a while, it looked like Jay might even be a suspect. They told us to be prepared for that. The next day, Jay's van was found 90 miles away in the city of Bellingham. There we go. There's one of the ties that was just like with Tanya down the scene. There it is. There's another one. Uh oh, we got some blood over here, it looks like. At the time, nobody was certain exactly what had happened, but uh, our concern was heightened a couple more notches once the van was found. We got something here, Fred. Two blocks away from the van, under the porch of a tavern, police found more plastic ties, the keys to Jay's van, Tanya's driver's license, and a half-empty box of ammunition. Significantly, they also found a pair of plastic surgical gloves. He leaves those behind as, a, as basically a sign to the police that you needn't look for fingerprints because I wore these gloves. And uh, he has confidence that there's nothing that's going to connect him with these crimes. Even after they found Tanya, uh, we hoped against hope that maybe they were going to find Jay, I mean, alive. Uh, I guess you know what's not very likely, but you have to keep hoping. Jay's body was found on um, Thanksgiving Day. He had been definitely murdered. It was very obvious. We found that uh, Jay had died uh, due to strangulation. He'd been beaten. His hands had been bound with some electrical tie wraps, plastic tie wraps. We think the way that Jay died was indicative of things that we've seen before inside the prison walls. And the things we found on Jay certainly raise a suspicion that the person or people who did this have been in the prison system before. Without telling you anything else, uh, that's definitely a possibility. Police believe it most likely that Jay and Tanya made their fatal rendezvous with the killer on the 10.20 p.m. ferry from Bremerton to Seattle. We don't know the killer's intentions when he first met these two. We feel that he was out to do some harm, and certainly to uh, assault both Jay and Tanya. And from what we have found, I think we can say that uh, he had set his sights on Tanya, and Jay was in the way. Lights. It's getting late. How you doing? Hi. Hey, what's up? Not much. You guys going to Seattle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you? They yeah. were friendly. You they Seattle? were uh, young. Um, on their first trip, and I think easily fooled. An easy mark. Hey, I wonder if you could do me a favor. It's pretty cold out there, and I only live a couple miles from the ferry dock. Can you give me a ride? A person could make contact with them in the lounge on the, on the ferry boat, uh, just asking for a ride across the uh, Puget Sound. I think it's safe to say that by the time they exited the ferry in downtown Seattle, they probably were in the company of, of the man that killed them. 
it would seem to me that it's logical that the person has committed crimes like this in the past and been successful at them. And having been successful, I would certainly say that uh, it's likely that he'll continue to do them. He does not want to be caught. He uses gloves, for example, to not leave obvious forensic fingerprints. That makes him very dangerous, in my view. But the killer might have made one mistake. He may have taken Jay's black waist-length ski jacket with red piping on the sleeves and Tanya's olive drab day pack. And there is a chance that someone may have noticed him with these incriminating items. Hi, Mrs. Cook. How's the holidays? Great, thanks. Good. Good. See you tomorrow. Yep, bye-bye. One final note on this sad story. Over the Christmas holidays, just four weeks after the murder of their children, Jay and Tanya's families each received a morbid greeting card. These cards were filled with taunting descriptions of the murders, and their author claimed responsibility for the killings. To date, 19 of these greeting cards have been mailed over three different holidays. The writer remains a complete mystery. Postmarked from New York, Los Angeles, and Seattle, all of these cards were written by the same author. The handwriting in these letters and the cards is very distinctive. And there are some phrases that are very distinctive also. Hallelujah, bloody Jesus is a favorite phrase of his. We have not found something as of yet in these greeting cards that would tell us absolutely for sure that the person who sent them is sending them is the killer. We don't know. He just continues to, to make life miserable for these parents who have lost their children. Next, the search for Salvatore Michael Caruana, a career criminal who masterminded a multi-million dollar drug smuggling ring. May 23rd, 1987, Groton, Connecticut. Agents from the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the U.S. Marshals Service tracked a fugitive to a local motor inn. Federal agents with a warrant. When they entered the room, the man they were looking for had vanished. Salvatore Michael Caruana is a suspected narcotic smuggler who allegedly has ties to organized crime. Since 1984, he has been the object of one of the most intensive manhunts in the history of U.S. law enforcement. Caruana is currently on the U.S. Marshals' top 15 fugitives list. They also believe he is being sought by the New England mob. When the federal agents found Caruana's room at the Motor Inn empty, they had first suspected that he might have been the victim of a contract hit. However, the authorities also believe it is possible that Caruana staged his own disappearance to look like a contract killing so he could throw law enforcement off his trail. Caruana's criminal history dates back to 1954 when he was charged with armed robbery and possession of firearms. By the late 70s, he had moved into narcotics as a mob soldier with the Raymond Patriarca family in New England. Mr. Caruana was involved in the distribution of approximately $40 million worth of marijuana. We have testimony from just one distributor that in one particular operation in 1979, he himself brought $4 million to Mr. Caruana. Hey, Sparky, let me see what we got going here. All right. In these marijuana yeah, operations that when Caruana was involved, five, he was with the supervisor. Caruana would show up on the scene himself at the stash house before the marijuana was sent out and talk to his people, make sure it was weighed correctly make sure the quality was good. He would then tell his distributor that I want X amount of dollars for each pound of marijuana that's here. I think it'll be good. What do you think? Hmm? 250 a pound, right? Freddy, don't keep me waiting. Be there. He carried guns, he was big with guns. Uh, he was big with threats. He would threaten to kill you. There was no question. If you messed up, he threatened to kill you. 
Caruana was finally arrested on November 27, 1983. His smuggling operation had begun to collapse with the arrest of several key associates whose testimony led to an 11-count secret grand jury indictment against him. Caruana was charged with drug trafficking under the Kingpin Statute, a federal law which could have meant life imprisonment. Straight ahead. Bail was set at $500,000. Caruana easily raised $50,000 to post bond and was released the same day. Caruana, be bond. Just in time. On April 2nd, 1984, two days before his trial was to begin, Salvatore Michael Caruana disappeared. Two of his close associates signed agreements with the government to cooperate and testify. I think he felt that our case was much stronger with these two witnesses coming into the case to testify against him. And I believe he just didn't want to come in and, and face that, because I think he felt that uh, he would face some serious time in jail. What do we have on this guy so far? In 1985, a multi-agency task force was established by the Drug Enforcement Administration, the IRS, the FBI, and the U.S. Marshals Service exclusively to investigate the Caruana case. They confirmed the smuggling drugs was only the facade for a vast criminal labyrinth. Caruana was laundering enormous amounts of money and was himself a multimillionaire. Checking on the medical uh, update. On February 6, 1987, federal agents and local police raided Caruana's home in Peabody, Massachusetts. The house is like a fortress with elaborate security systems and several hidden vaults crammed full of weapons and financial papers. Agents found evidence that Caruana was using the alias of John Michael Hurley. Armed with this information, investigators were able within days to track Caruana to an East Hampton, Connecticut condominium. By the time they arrived, Caruana had cleaned the place out and vanished. For the next three months, he continued to elude the law. He's a very smart guy. He's probably one of the most cunning and sly fugitives uh, that we've come across in a very long time. He knows what he's doing. He keeps himself up to date on all the new things that are coming out. He's a very smart individual. Look at those numbers jump up. Agents discovered that while Caruana was in hiding, he used computer technology to launder money and communicate with his business associates and his wife. He used things like computer bulletin board systems that he knew it was very difficult for us to get into. He would talk to his wife up in Massachusetts from Connecticut, and they would go through these computer bulletin board systems. And she would take the message decode it, and then it would be wiped off that bulletin board system. Finally, in May of 1987, an anonymous tip led authorities to the Motor Inn in Groton, Connecticut. We had determined he was using the alias Vincent Spirito, and based upon the information we received from the manager and the fact that the alias name was registered there at that Motor Inn, uh, we used that as probable cause to get a search warrant to enter the apartment. Yeah, one, yeah, four. Four, go. Four, you're in the best position. Uh, what do you see? What's going on, Joe, I think? Still nothing. Nothing's going on. OK, we've given it enough time. Let's, uh, let's move in, guys. When we first got into the room, it appeared like, geez, he just got up to get a newspaper that he could be coming back any minute. OK, we're secure, all right? We're all secure. Okay. But once we started looking at specific items in the room, such as the newspaper and spoiled food, it looked like he hadn't been there for a couple of weeks. Yeah, look at this newspaper. It's dated May 9. We found clothes in the closet. We found the uh, John Michael Hurley identification. Uh, we also found a sawed-off shotgun with four shells up in the barrel, so it was ready to be what we call combat-loaded. We also located a briefcase. In the briefcase was a semi-automatic 22 and cash. From what we found at the motor, and you could assume that he had been killed by organized crime people who thought that if he was Looks caught, like he might talk, busy. or he had all these records that could implicate them in different illegal uh, transactions. But we don't have the body. And if it was an organized crime hit, I would think that they would want to leave the body behind so that we wouldn't keep poking our noses into his business, which eventually would lead back to them. Who's got the paperwork? I've got it. 
Caruana's van was missing. So were the keys to the van, his wallet, and a camera case he was known to carry with him at all times. In the camera case, reportedly, he carried an Uzi submachine gun. A month later, Caruana's van turned up at a police impoundment lot. It had been abandoned at a Connecticut truck stop. When marshals dusted for fingerprints, they found the van had been wiped clean. He could very well have been killed in May of 87, but we really don't have anything to point to that. We don't have anybody coming forward and saying, yes, I saw him abducted from the truck stop. When you chase fugitives that are this complex, one of the things they like to do is leak the word out to you that, hey, this guy's dead, so that you don't continue looking for him as hard as you were if you knew he was alive. It appears that he's done the very smart thing. He hasn't maintained contact with the people that he knew before we were chasing him. What we're looking for is somebody to come forward and tell us that they have seen Salvatore Caruana alive after May of 87. Salvatore Michael Caruana is 51 years old, six feet tall and 175 pounds. He has brown eyes and graying black hair and has been treated for a hyperthyroid condition. He has used the aliases John Michael Hurley, Vincent Spirito, and Face. Caruana is a licensed airplane pilot and a computer and electronics expert. He should be considered armed and extremely dangerous. Caruana allegedly holds damaging information about many highly placed organized crime figures, and the federal authorities hope they get to him before the mob does. Tonight we have seen four stories without endings, four stories in which ordinary people have been thrust into the center of an unsolved mystery. Perhaps someone tonight can help them. Perhaps they were watching. Perhaps it's you.